with us now on the iTricks interview is a good friend of iTricks. You can see him on scamschool.tv as well as his BB Live show at a bblivershow.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Brushwood, welcome to the oh, iTricks interview. Believe, I can't believe you meant to the BB Live show. That thing is a freaking train wreck, but that is very nice of you to, to plug nonetheless. Which this will be the best produced iTricks interview in our history. Because not only do we have the Cam Twist program that we use the video edit, but also uh, Brian Brushwood with a newly registered copy of Vid Blaster. That's right. That's right. In fact, I got all kinds of fanciness I can throw up on the screen here. We can have a war, a duel, a duel of, uh, of of gizmos here. Exactly. We can just switch around. It doesn't matter. There we go. All right. Well, let's get right into the questions. We'll start at the top with a few that we always ask of the people that are on the iTricks interview. Outside of magic. Give me some of Brian Brushwood's influences. Oh, man, that's a really good question. I guess certainly within Magic, I'm going to say Penn and Teller just to get that out of the way. But outside of Magic, I've always loved video games and geek, geeky entertainment. You know, I'm into kung fu movies, robots, explosions, and, uh, you know, hardcore music. I don't know, uh, stuff that, uh, that I guess most teenage geeks are into. Can you, can you give me just a, a, a list of flicks for people, for, for the Brian Brushwood fan, the, you know, just a few of your favorite genre, genre flicks off the top of your head? Uh, you know, like I said, anything with robots, explosions, or kung fu is okay with me. That's sort of my standard checklist whenever I go to the movie theater. Gotcha. And uh, it, it's pretty much with robots, kung fu, explosions, and after that, it's all, it's all females. I don't really understand it. <laughs> But uh, I guess, I don't know, I guess like The Prestige was a good movie in spite of the fact that it had no robots, no kung fu, and no explosions. Indeed, indeed. I think there was explosions. There was Tesla, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, there was all sorts. Of, I mean, and there was like murdering. I mean, I don't want to get into, you know, the, the ending of the movie. <laughs> yeah, especially that twist at the end when Spock died and Rosebud <laughs> turned out to be a sled. You that know, especially awesome. when, when, when Hugh Jackman turns out to be Kaiser Soze. I was totally bummed. <laughs> oh, no, there it is. <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, uh, speaking of, you know, this, the sci-fi genre stuff, this is our, one of our, actually, I would say hands down our favorite questions. The You're going back in time. You're meeting a young Brian Brushwood at How any period in your life before okay. to okay. alter history. What would you tell young Brian, and when would it be? And if, if you can make it as specific as a, a, a moment in time, like, uh, th that would be, that'd be great. But you don't understand. Uh, it's like, uh, I guess I didn't really think about in terms of altering history because yes. I've actually thought about this a lot. So yes, I mean, finally, somebody who has. No, no, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i talking about for decades. I've thought pretty much since I was a child, I would always look back. To me, it's all about what would eighth grade Brian say? And so nice. as I hit various benchmarks in my life, I've looked back and, I, and I've said, what would, what would eighth grade Brian say? And uh, now I know the point of the thing is to what advice would you give to eighth grade Brian? But I got to tell you, I step out of the time machine and I run on out and I'm like, dude, I'm you in uh, in a number of years. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, first of all, to be honest, all I would do is brag. I would go back to eighth grade Brian and be like, dude, you know, the guy who makes Ultima, those games that you love so much, that guy's going to go into space. He's like, no way. And I was like, yeah. And he's going to do one of your tricks. My tricks? You mean I'll invent a trick? No, no, no. You'll host a show on the internet where you'll teach tricks, and the guy from Ultima's going to go to space and do one of your tricks. Shut up! Get out of here! No way! <laughs> that's so, so for you, it's more, it's more just reassuring. And, and, and on a serious note, I think that's a lot of the theme that we kind of get with this question is just calming down, you know, the fears of like, hey, you know, you're into weird stuff. And just to reassure you, number one, yes, you are weird. Number two, that's good. That's a oh, very, yeah. very good thing. A hundred percent. And, uh, but you know, I, I guess that's the thing. When I was a kid, I, I wasn't like a lot of kids in that I loved being weird. I mean, yeah. to me, I was like, Hey, that's kind of cool that I'm not like everyone else. And I kind of, you know, I probably went through a phase where I was annoyingly weird for weirdness's sake. But the idea that as an adult, I'd be making a living by being a weirdo. That's something that eighth grade Brian would be pretty freaking stoked about. I think. Now, now the other thing is, uh, do you think that that would affect maybe how you went about stuff if if you knew that uh, that things were going to end up all right? Well, you know that's a that's a common uh, uh, trick that they say that success gurus say is they say they say what would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? And it's funny because for most people that opens up a whole avenue that had never occurred to them. Uh, but I guess luckily, I mean, I guess I kind of went for it. I was like, I don't know, I try to be on the Tonight Show. I don't know, I try to host my own show on the internet. I don't know, I try to make a living. <laughs> 
sticking nails in my eyes and being an idiot professionally. And apparently, apparently it worked. I don't know. Apparently there's a market for that. Apparently, for everything. Uh, thanks to your show with Revision 3, Scam School, you've carved out a very big niche as a internet magician, something that very, very few people can say that they derive any kind of income from. Yeah, uh, and I don't even know how much room there is here. I mean, the internet magician is already a tiny category. Yeah. The, the internet subgroup of that. The only thing smaller than that I can imagine is like the internet magician news portal. That would be just crazy. <laughs> I don't know who would be doing that. Who on earth would visit such a niche? I don't know. But good luck to whatever crazy person decides to try that. I know, I know. I, I want to know what, what happens to eighth grade that that jerk. You know, <laughs> if you can reassure him. Don't worry. Show up. You're going to be in news. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Come from magicians. Well, that's, that's kind of cool. On the internet. <laughs> What's ah. the internet? <laughs> right, right, exactly. All right, well, well, let me ask you this. This is obviously a, a burgeoning kind of market. I mean, we've seen more people get into this space as opposed to less. Where do you see magic on the internet going? Especially considering, you know, so much of it is built around stealing, which can't be great for the market, right? You know, I don't know. It's, uh, that, that's a really good question. And I got to tell you, I, I try, I've almost gotten to where I try to not make that the subject of every interview I do because I'm so fascinated by this question uh, because it's a matter of, Intellectual property right on the internet is already nutty to begin with. Yeah. But then we throw in the interesting wrinkle of ownership as it's perceived among magicians, where we play by gentlemen's rules and we guard each other's material, and, and the very nature of what we do and teach can't be copywritten or patented. I, I mean, it is a really interesting time out there. And, and the short answer, the cop-out answer is, it's going to sort itself out. It always does. You know, just like when movies came out, I'm sure there was some version of the masked magicians in the silent film era. And I'm sure there was some version of the, you know, we had the, uh, the mass magicians in the late nineties, which was just a rehash of stuff that had been done before. And now we're seeing a similar thing with YouTube and somehow it's going to make itself right. And I don't know what that answer is. And I'm really interested in, to watch the exploration itself, but I'll tell you this much. It's getting the gaps, and I think you and I might have talked about this before, but the gaps are getting smaller. We sort of had, in, in the 1600s, there were the people who knew the secrets, and then there was everybody else. And there yeah. was no way, if you were somebody else, the only way to learn the secrets was to apprentice under a master and be given those secrets. And then we had libraries and printing presses, and then all of a sudden, most of the secrets were just in the library. And then we had video, and all of a sudden, they could bring out a bunch of those secrets on... Um, uh, uh, on television, and now it's the internet, and, and and what you're seeing is I think a lot of people don't really want to know the answers to a lot of a, a, yeah. a lot of they want the wonder and to be fooled, and, and so certainly they, more people who have access as opposed to less don't want to know it. Certainly, certainly, absolutely. But uh, you know, I, I I I'm as interested as anyone else to know where it's going to head. I'm trying really hard to keep ourselves on the right side of things. I think there's a big difference between teaching and exposure. I think exposure is something that denigrates magic, that takes it down a peg, that reduces people's enjoyment of it. It reduces their appreciation for it. And then I think there's uh, there's teaching, which brings people in. It gives them that that first taste for free before it corrupts them and drags them all the way down the rabbit hole of magic. Yeah, and. The thing I like about Scam School, and it kind of brings me back, one time I was talking, I was doing an interview with, with Eric DeCamps, and he was talking about a time long ago in New York City when the, the stand-up comedian and the magician were in the same standing. They were both just members of, of the Variety Act class. Who was this? I, this was a long, a, a time long ago in, in, the, in the, it was long before the comedy boom of the 80s when they both kind of played these Variety Act, th these variety act yep. things. Uh, it was during the 80s when, when, uh, when all of a sudden stand-up comedy became a half step below rock and roll. And yes. meanwhile, still down here doing birthday parties. Exactly, exactly. But I think a lot of it was because the accessibility of magic didn't match what stand-up comedy was. Like, on some level, you could, you could see yourself becoming a stand-up comedian. You couldn't see yourself becoming a magician. And what I like about Scam School is that it, it, it brings back a little bit of that accessibility. You can see a point in your life when you want to do something that you see on, on your show. 
Well, sure. and I'm glad you noticed that because that's the filter. I, and and again, where is internet magic headed? Pretty much every secret is already out there on the internet. Yeah. What you're looking for is you're looking for filters, uh, guides to take you through the experience of magic. And the filter we're trying to provide at Scam School is something, look, we're not going to snow you. We're not going to tell you, here's a here's a hilarious trick that'll totally fool your friends involving two <laughs> paper clips in this bill. Yeah. We're not, we're not going to do that. It's all going to be working stuff that you and I would actually do out at the bar. And and I tell you, the response has been phenomenal because a year ago when we first launched Scam School, there was a lot of comparisons to what else had been out there. And I knew that I was like, guys, just wait and see what we've got in store for you. We're, you're going to see that we're not the real hustle. You're going to see that we're not, uh, you know, Penn and Teller's BS, you know, and, yeah. uh, and it's starting to happen now to where other shows are posting videos they're hitting on dig and people are coming up saying yeah scam school really handled this better because because we're establishing our own brand and our own filter uh and our own i guess i don't know our, our own our own crew our own people absolutely oh and and the fact you know you you can it's never a bad thing to have the dig crowd on your side i guess uh, yeah <laughs> well, and, and i tell you it's story. it's uh, scam it's a school did it yeah <laughs> i'm glad finally it's my turn <laughs> More than it was just like, you know, Real Hustle did it. I was like, ah, no, they didn't. They did some other thing. Yeah.